Well, Glenn, thank you for doing this. The, um, the move from legal services in Ohio, mm -hmm. where you were doing high impact litigation for a period of a decade uh, mm -hmm. uh, into a teaching practice here at Cornell Law School. What, what prompted that? Um, a variety of things. Um, first of all, I've always been open to doing different things. Um, and I had been in the military for several years, and then I was in, went back to undergraduate school. I quit undergraduate school in the middle, went in the military, came back out, finished undergrad, then went to law school and um, started in uh, legal services first with migrant farm workers and then a general civil practice. Um, and then I moved after a couple of years of that to um, an organization that did impact litigation. Almost it did, did and still does. It still does, uh, very much so. Uh, almost exclusively federal class actions. Uh, Low-income housing, consumer, uh, government benefits, um, employment. We did a lot of desegregation of police departments, fire departments, um, closing down jails and prisons with unconstitutional conditions, that sort of thing. So it was a very different sort of practice, but it was the difference that was interesting. Um, and then at some point, and frankly I think it had more to do with the geography of, of Ohio, I was raised in Pittsburgh, uh, which is hilly, um, and um, I was just interested in the change of geography. I had a great job, uh, I had terrific people to work with. Uh, People in Ohio are frankly very friendly people and all, but I just was interested in the change. Um, and I started looking around and had an offer someplace else, but then I saw the Cornell ad. I had done some teaching um, as a lawyer. Did and you have students at, working with you? In, yes, in, in, at the University of Toledo. I did yeah, a semester yeah. with students there, but I also taught for two years when I was in the military. Mm -hmm. Everything from sergeants to, to lieutenant colonels. Um, and so I had some teaching experience uh, and enjoyed it. And I thought, well, maybe this would be a good shift. Uh, and it was a great move for my family as well. Um, the kids were young enough that coming to Ithaca wouldn't be too traumatic. and. Um, it turned out to be the best move we ever made. Um, and I was here 30 years, I guess. Um, and it was the ideal move uh, right. in the sense that I still was litigating, which is why I became a lawyer to begin with. Uh, and I was litigating only on behalf of low income people. Um, but I wasn't having to do all the drudge work. The students were doing that. Uh, but that was just, that's, that's a collateral benefit. Uh, what I really enjoyed was the fact that I could, I could see students who would start with, base, with a basic theoretical knowledge of the legal system, but absolutely no practical experience whatsoever. Uh, so they, they really, were incompetent to practice law at that point. But by the end of a semester, they were competent. Mm -hmm. uh, I had students who did a full-blown jury trial by the end of the semester, mm -hmm. one semester. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did it well. Uh, so whatever they lacked in uh, knowledge or experience, they made up for it with enthusiasm and vigor and motivation. Um, and there's nothing better than to teach somebody who's motivated, uh, no matter what their skill levels are. If they're motivated enough, uh, teaching is an absolute joy. And I had the blessing of never having taught a course here that was a required course where a student was there because they didn't, because they had to be there. Every student who took a clinic or trial advocacy or did an externship 
did it because they really wanted that experience. Um, and what more can you ask for as a teacher? Huh. Could you describe the, um, the teaching practice that you joined in 86 and how it evolved through your experience mm -hmm. of it? When I first came, um, there were five faculty attorneys, um, and we all did pretty much the same thing. That is, in some ways, we were kind of fungible. Uh, we could shift on the cases and the students at any given point in time, which actually was very practical, especially in the summers, because we would be covering each other's cases during those periods of time. Um, the cases were generally quote, small cases, that is small in terms of dollar values, et cetera. Uh, and we tried to pick relatively simple cases in terms of the law. Um, and not cases like those you've been doing. Which exactly, very, very institutional different. institutional change. Uh, I, uh, yeah. The cases yeah. I did, well, for example, I had, I had a case back in Ohio that was five years old when I picked it up. I handled it for the full 10 years I was there. It continued on five years after I left. In fact, even now, it periodically gets pulled up, consent decree, violation, that sort of thing. Um, and so if we had those kinds of cases here in the clinic, a student would see a very tiny slice of a very large piece of litigation. We tried to pick cases in the clinic that ideally you could start at the beginning of the semester and end by the end of the semester. Now, that often did not happen. They often would go over one, two, three semesters, but often they would finish up quickly. So a student would start with an intake interview, uh, be involved in starting to do the basic research on whether the client had a case or not, doing document drafting, client counseling, negotiation, uh, prepping for trials or hearings, actually doing a trial or hearing, sometimes doing an appeal. Uh, but they could often see a case from start to finish. And let's say it was a warranty of habitability case. Well, they could have understood from uh, a doctrinal class what a warranty of habitability was. But until they got into the clinic, they didn't know what court to file it in. They didn't know how to draft a complaint. They had never met a client before. They never dealt with the various legal and non-legal consequences of doing litigation, estimating how long litigation would take, uh, what the costs were financially, emotionally, psychologically uh, in doing litigation what it took to investigate a case, to collect evidence that you could actually get admitted into court, doing a hearing, all those things became part of what they really did and took the theory into its actual practice. Uh, as we know, it, it, it's it maybe a little, little less so now, but it's al almost possible to go through law school and never having done any of those things. To then take the bar exam without ever having met a client, drafted a complaint, done a cross-examination of a witness, done investigation, written an appeal. All those things can happen afterwards. You can just sit in a classroom, listen to a lecture, and then take a, a written exam at the end, and then you're supposed to be competent to practice law. And even if you pass the bar exam, that doesn't test for your ability to do any of those things I listed. Um, and that, that's kind of dangerous. Um, you think of the medical school analogy. No medical school is going to let one of their graduates leave without having actually performed all those operations uh, and having worked with clients and patients. Uh, Law school, it's still possible to come pretty close to that, although I take it there are some ABA requirements now of, of some minimal skills level uh, courses, but even the bar exams don't really test for that, uh, although I think California is starting to toy with that a bit. Um, so what I think, 
the really smart students figured that out. They realized that they could get through law school and never really attain any true competency as a lawyer. So they often will take a clinic or a skills course or, or an externship where they get some of that practical experience. And they get it under the direct and immediate supervision of a skilled practitioner whose primary goal is to ensure that student leaves competent. Glenn, you were on a roll about how the smart students have learned mm -hmm. or, or perceive that they can get through law school without um, mm -hmm. doing skills courses or having, uh, you know, acquiring the competence to be a lawyer, mm -hmm. but that they, having perceived that, then choose those kinds of yes. courses. Yes, and, and, yeah. and that's frankly where the motivation yeah. arose. Yeah. Um, because they were taking the course not because they necessarily thought it was going to help their GPA. Uh, and they even had the impression that maybe it wouldn't help their job prospects because a lot of the places they were going seemed to focus more on their grade point average, their ranking in the class, and less on what they were actually studying. I think that was probably incorrect. I think a lot of legal employers, whether they be a big white shoe firm or a smaller one, really did pay attention to how much experience or potential experience a student might have as, in actually practicing law, not just studying it. But I think students felt that they were taking the clinic or an externship or a skills course for themselves and not because it was necessarily going to position them better. Uh, again, I, I, I disagree. I think it did position them better with employers, but I don't think they saw that. Now, for a time, uh, you, you directed a clinic, too, mm -hmm. so that you joined the clinic as a staff attorney lecturer, and then, mm -hmm. then you directed the clinic for a time. Um, and you've done a diversity of other, had a number, diversity of other teaching roles, all right? Mm -hmm. you, you, for a time, did a, one of the specialized clinics with Gary Simpson. I right. don't know how long that lasted. That was two or three years. Two anyhow. or three years. You taught, what was it? It was, it was a religious liberty clinic. Right. And that clinic, we really did do large cases. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting to do, and it provided a different sort of experience for students. Not the kind of experience where they would be meeting themselves with the client doing all the investigation, the, the case strategies, etc. They were more like clerks uh, for Gary and for me. Um, Gary focused on the substantive area. I focused on the actual practice, the procedure. Um, and those cases would last a couple years at a time. Uh, but students came in knowing that that was the nature of the clinical experience that they were going to have. Um, I think that is a helpful experience for students, and it can be fairly inspiring for them, too, to have play a role in, in a major case. But uh, because of the nature of those cases, they only get a slice. And I, I don't think that's an adequate substitute for a clinic where they're handling a, quote, small unemployment insurance benefits case that they start at the, in September and they finish in de December. Um, and it, I say there are small cases, but in fact, um, that case may be the most important thing in that client's life. Because whether they get that unemployment insurance benefit, which may only be a few hundred dollars a month, that will determine whether they're going to eat, whether they're going to pay their rent, whether their kids are going to be adequately clothed. It can be the most important thing in their life. Uh, and uh, I think and that, students experiencing that have a much better sense of And that supervised lawyer experience uh, has value even for the student who is headed for a radically different Absolutely. career in terms of clients and matters. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Because again, they're dealing with a client. Now they may go to some large firm in New York where they may not see a client for a few years, um, but it's good to know that you're working for somebody else. Uh, and they're going to have to learn how to deal with fact investigation, client interviewing, client counseling, uh, dealing with documents, uh, and certainly drafting uh, legal documents. All of that will happen in a clinic, whether you're doing an unemployment insurance case or a welfare case or a divorce, in the same way you would be dealing with with a large firm that's moving big chunks of money around or involved in litigation. Um, and then I don't recall exactly when it was, but I imagined it to be in the 90s, you commenced the Teach Trial Advocacy. Yes, I, I did that for 25 years. It was in the early 90s. I helped out Faust um, playing the adjunct role a couple times, and then he apparently decided to shift to other topic, uh, other subjects, uh, and I picked up the trial advocacy course. Um, in some ways, trial advocacy was my most fun course. And maybe it's because I tend to be control-oriented. The one thing about teaching the clinic is you don't have full control. That case has a mind of its own. It involves judges and courts and clients who may want to take the, their, their work in, a, in different directions. In trial ad, I could set that all up. I could set it up so students would have relatively uniform experiences, and I could handle 55 students, whereas in a clinic, I could really only handle maybe eight or nine students a semester. That was my full-time job, is dealing with those eight or nine students and their cases. But in trial ad, I could have 55 students, and uh, we'd meet three, four times a week. Uh, it was a very intense course, but it, there was a lot of control over what that experience was going to be. Um, so I, I think I enjoyed seeing so many students progress rapidly. Um, and I think it's that rap, rapid progression of knowledge and skills that was probably the most satisfying part of it. Uh, whether it be a clinic or a trial ad, I started with a student who had some basic legal theoretical knowledge but was pretty much clueless on how to employ it. Uh, but after a semester, they would be radically different students. Would I be right in supposing that it, it would be true of both the clinic and trial advocacy, that some students who had not found their strength mm -hmm. in the classroom suddenly said, this profession is for me. After yes. all, I, I can really do this. I had many students who, coming into the clinic, would say, you know, I'm, I'm toying with the idea of leaving law school. Uh, I don't see why I'm here. I'm not as comfortable uh, dealing with the, the work. Uh, it's not as interesting as I thought it would be. I don't see how it impacts lives, uh, but once they employed it uh, with real clients and saw the impact that they could have. Um, their attitudes changed dramatically. Um, now, that certainly wasn't true of all students by any means, uh, but a good percentage of students, um, in fact, I saw this particularly early on, back in the late 80s and early 90s, a student would come in at the beginning of their second year and they take Legal Aid One, um, and they were so enthusiastic about it, and they particularly wanted to carry over their cases from the fall semester into the spring. They would take Legal Aid Two, and then the next year they take Legal Aid Three, uh, which is really pretty much a continuation of, of what they did. And they would spend, you know, uh, not just one, but two, three, maybe even four semesters uh, doing clinical work. Um, and that often would cause some, anyhow, to veer off 
toward public interest mm -hmm. practice afterwards. Now, of course, that wasn't practical for a lot of students. It's expensive to go to law school, and they had to be cognizant of what they were going to have to be paying back. Um, it, it was something that never crossed my mind. When I went to law school, I was on the GI Bill. My wife was in graduate school. She had a full-ride scholarship uh, for social work. Uh, we left law school owing $1,000. Hmm. Now, it was a long time ago. $1,000 was real money then, but uh, it's not like what our students are But it are didn't seeing. affect your career choice. No, no I, yeah. my yeah. career choice had been yeah. made even before I went to law school. I'd worked for a legal services program as an investigator before I went to law school. I knew that's what I wanted to do, and I had the freedom to do that. Uh, a lot of our students don't have that. Uh, now, the loan forgiveness program, I think, has made a big difference. Uh, but it's still a slog, uh, and uh, I was also wondering about the trial advocacy program. If there weren't students who, uh, in it, discovered that the skill set they had, which didn't demonstrate itself uh, powerfully on law school mm -hmm. exams, fit this kind of lawyer work. Yes. Yeah. A absolutely. Um, in fact, you know, I was thinking back to the students who were the top couple students in trial ad. Um, I didn't see a close correlation between those students and their success in more doctrinal courses and their success in trial ad. Um, certainly, sometimes that was true, uh, but it did employ a different facets of their personality and their skills that were irrelevant in a doctrinal classroom. Uh, now, clearly, uh, and this is one thing I, I think sometimes clinicians forget, and that is if a student doesn't understand the basics, doesn't think clearly, uh, does not understand the theory, uh, they're not ultimately going to be good practitioners. Uh, they really do have to understand the doctrinal stuff. Um, but it isn't, the doctrinal uh, background is not alone going to make you good at actually litigating or representing it's clients. It's essential, but it's not sufficient. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Reflections on your role as teaching through the externship program. Uh, there's a, mm -hmm. been an explosion of student mm -hmm. going offshore, if you will, yes. uh, to have experiential learning in some practice setting or another with supervision or oversight being exercised by a faculty person mm -hmm. here. And if I remember correctly, that was once dispersed, but then it, in the end, started to coalesce around you. What happened was, and this had to be close to 20 years ago, we had been allowing students to do externships on an ad hoc basis. A student would say, uh, you know, my mother's ill, she's living in Texas, I need to be down there, I don't want to stop law school, my mom doesn't want me to stop law school, but I can't be in Ithaca. Um, and the student would go to the dean of students or the academic dean and ex explain this problem. And one thing led to another, and the dean would say, well, look, why don't you find a, a job, and we'll get a faculty person here to sort of oversee it. And sometimes that involved the faculty member very closely with the student, and the regular communication. Uh, and the student would work for a legal services program in Texas or whatever, or clerk for a judge. And the faculty person would then have the student write a paper at the end. Um, and they get full credit for it. And the school would get the tuition, the student would have a good experience because the student chose where he or she was going to go and would naturally choose some place where they thought they would learn something and it would be helpful to um, their body of legal knowledge. Um, but other times, the faculty person had a pretty hands-off approach, 
and would just read a paper at the end of the semester and really have virtually no contact with the student in the meantime. And certainly not go visit the site. Well, Gary Simpson uh, at that point I think was the academic dean and uh, the, the issue arose with the faculty and the faculty said we ought to do something about this, we ought to make it consistent, add some rigor to it and ensure that the students are getting their money's worth out of this. Yeah, I mean, and another loose part of the recipe was well, what was expected of the employer? Or I mean, yes. What? what yeah. What? How were these students? To it be really used? wouldn't. Yeah. Very few standards. Yeah. There, there, it all depended on what that faculty person thought should happen, and what that employer, <coughs> excuse me, was willing to do. <coughs> so, as a result of a study of this, um, we we set up a course, an externship course, um, that did have standards, did have requirements of employers, expectations of the employers. Uh, we, we allowed the student to choose where they were going to go, subject to our approval of it, and a student couldn't just go to a big law firm and just do an extra summer <laughs> during the school year and get credit for it. Um, they had to go to a nonprofit or a governmental agency. We did have some exceptions for for-profit organizations in very specialized area areas where we had few course offerings: entertainment law, sports law. So we could send somebody to the National Hockey League, uh, which is definitely for profit. Uh, but. Uh, that experience was something that re would really supplement the few courses we had here on sports law. Uh, so we had some exceptions like that. Um, but it did become more and more popular because I think a lot of students said, and I've already alluded to this, that law school is three years. It may be a semester or maybe a year too long. I mean, I get it after two years. Um, and they're looking for that experience that's going to bridge the gap between the theory and the study to the actual practice of law. So the smart students, as I mentioned before, either take a clinic, an externship, or some skills courses that sort of jump that chasm uh, between, pra uh, between theory and practice. And the externships were especially good because it allowed the student to choose from the whole panoply of possibilities out there in the real world uh, that didn't exist in a previously set up clinic here uh, uh, in Ithaca. And, and choose geography too. Geography was probably one of the primary factors because often, I'd probably say 80% of the time, there was a boyfriend, girlfriend, or a fiance, or a family uh, member in the location where they were headed, or it was a city that they wanted to go to ultimately. I, and for example, I had a student who went to Chicago. She had no connection with Chicago, but she was interested in going to the Midwest, and she figured the only way she could ultimately land a good job in Chicago was she need, one, she wanted to know if she really wanted to go there, and an externship was a way to test that. Two, she wanted to develop contacts. In fact, I make a really big deal, or I did, make a big deal of the students having as one of their goals, making contacts. It's not good enough to just go to Chicago and clerk for a judge. You want to go there, you want to join the law student bar association there, you want to go to bar association events, you want to call Cornell alumni who live in Chicago and just call them up and offer to take them out to coffee or lunch, get a feel for what this place is like, particularly if it's one where you might want to end up. And a lot of students did that. Very few students were employed by the place that hired them as an extern. In fact, the expectation was they, this was not a look-see for that particular job. Um, but, uh, but it clearly was an opportunity to, to look further down the road in their careers and how this externship would fit into that. Uh, I, did, I did have some students who, though, were hired uh, at their externship. In fact, I had one 
who was hired, they tried to hire him during the externship. They, he was there a month or so, and they said, you know, this is working out so well, let's just pay you. Um, and, Unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> but the ABA rule was you either get money or you get credit, but you don't get both. Uh, so what he did was he did his mandatory, I think it was 65 work days. I think that was it. Once he finished the 65th day, he went on the payroll even before he graduated. But he had met all the criteria yeah. for, for, for the uh, passing the course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there. So, uh, and and the, the dimensions, I mean, this program grew, right? To the point that, w uh, yeah, what uh, fraction would you, would you guess uh, by the time you turned it over to someone else? Um, A quarter? 20, 25, a semester, so 50 students uh, a year. And so that's, you know, a quarter of the class. Mm -hmm. um, you know, about a quarter of the class. And that, that's a fairly significant group of people who are leaving the physical premises. In, in fact, I occasionally would kid with whoever the dean was at the times we were talking about this, uh, that, you know, if you really wanted, you could take in 25 more students, fill those seats, we'd send the other 25 out to do externships, you'd get a lot of tuition dollars. Uh, it would be a money maker. Uh, but it was a joke, uh, because the expectation was that um, we were going to, it, it was almost a f almost full-time job to keep track of the 25 students because I was dealing with their, their weekly journals. I was helping the next group of students get set up in their externships and approving those. Uh, I was visiting every site every semester. Uh, I was reviewing the, 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 the um, the, the on-site supervisor's um, evaluations of the students. Um, so it, it kept me pretty busy. Uh, it was fascinating because the students were all, almost always doing different things. Uh, and we had a web-based uh, discussion board as well that the students were involved in. I would probably have contact with each of those students anywhere from one to six times a week, uh, then plus my actual visit. Uh, Could you say a bit more about the weekly expectations of them to do a journal or a, at, at one a time, reflection piece? Or yes, a, it know? was a reflection piece, and I'm glad you mentioned that, because at one time we had this paper requirement. They do a paper at the end, and the expectation was they'd be working on the paper and there'd be drafts, et cetera. Well, after doing that a semester or two, it dawned on me that um, for many of the students, doing the paper was make work. They were just doing it because it was a requirement, not because it was helpful to them. Sometimes it was something they were doing as part of their actual employment, but then it raised questions about what I could see. Hmm. Uh, because another thing that was very important was they could not share with me client privileged information. And their employers needed to be very confident that that wouldn't happen. And the last thing I wanted was to ever be in a position where I'd see something that I knew I shouldn't see and then have to either report the student to the bar or tell the employer. I uh, just didn't want to deal with it. So the papers were a problem. The third problem with the papers was that um, they tended to be really boring and I had no interest in them. And I'm thinking, I'm reading this, but I don't want to read it. The student didn't want to write it. Uh, why am I doing this? And it comes uh, at the end of the experience, yeah, so there's exactly. nothing. Exactly. There's nothing I can do about nothing it in anyway. Do. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I dropped the paper. I said, what I'm really interested in is what you're feeling as you're going through this experience. How you think this experience is going to impact your life later on. What does it mean? to you as you embark on a career as a lawyer. That's what's interesting to me. That's what I think is interesting to you. And frankly, that should be easy to write about. So I want you once a week 
for the time you're there to say to yourself, what happened to me this last week? Why do I care? Why am I here? What am I going to do with this? Mm -hmm. um, so the students would just do a stream of consciousness reflective piece once a week. Uh, I didn't care about their grammar, their spelling. I just wanted them to think about that. Only I would see it. Their, their supervisor would not see it. So if they had a bad week with the supervisor, they could ventilate on that well, issue. If, and if, how if to they saw with... things that their supervisor was doing that they exactly. were not pleased with. Why? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, that turned out terrific. In fact, I'm, so many students said at the beginning, said, oh, yeah, I'm going to do a journal, you know. Yeah, that that's, that's really Mickey Mouse. <laughs> but so many of them later said, you know, I'm keeping that piece because I want to go look at that 10 years from now mm -hmm. because that really made a difference. And then I had the discussion board where I would put a topic up for the week and the students would interact with each other. On the and basis of whatever they were experiencing. Exactly. They were. Yeah. Okay. Now, I often would put a topic up, but then I would, I would specifically tell them, just because I put a topic up doesn't mean that's what you should necessarily write about. In fact, I'd much prefer you to ignore the topic I put up for the week and talk about something that impacted you that you'd like to share with the others. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to do an essay, mm -hmm. just two or three lines. Mm -hmm. And then two or three times during the week, go back to the discussion board, look at other people's comments and reactions to what you said and things that they raised, and just jump in and out, make it conversational. Uh, so it wasn't done at a given point in time where everybody would sort of sit there and try to interact. They, they'd interact periodically throughout the week. Because um, often, I, I tried that once. I tried once where I'd have everybody have a classroom session where we'd all at the same time and place, well, not the same place, we'd be in different places. Um, but it was awful. Uh, you know, somebody would be thinking, oh, I've got this big project I've got to finish up and I'm scheduled to have this class or I'm not interested in talking about anything today. Or I'm really interested, but I'm only interested in this, you know. Uh, so it's much easier to let them do it free form. An uh, example or two of the kinds of things that. Well, uh, you mentioned sometimes mm -hmm. supervisor problems, yeah. uh, and those were especially helpful uh, because uh, sometimes I would deal one on one with a student who had a supervisor problem because it would often come up in their journals because they knew I was the only one seeing that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they'd raise it during the discussion board as well. And it was amazing how helpful each of the students were with, one with each other uh, because they'd have a similar uh, issue or, or, and, and they'd come up with different techniques to deal with it. Um, and I always told students that if there was a supervision problem that I would intervene, but only under a couple conditions. One is the student and I had to talk it through ourselves first and strategize all the possibilities that could involve solving the problem without me intervening. And the second thing was I would never intervene if they didn't want me to intervene. Because it would be easy for me to come in to a supervisor and say, look, you're giving the student Mickey Mouse work. Uh, they're spending $30,000 to work for you for free. They need legal work. They want to expand their experience. They don't want to just do grunt work for you. I could do that. Then I'd walk out, and then the supervisor at the site would turn to the student and say, well, I wonder where Glenn got that idea, you know? <laughs> And the student would have to suffer the consequences of it. So uh, there, there were times when I did intervene, but only when the student and I talked it through and the student gave me permission to do mm -hmm. it. Uh, but usually when the problems came up, we were able to come up with strategies that they could employ without me sort of having to directly confront mm -hmm. a supervisor. Uh, but those, those were common. Yeah. Just uh, dealing with clients who are frustrating, uh, dealing
dealing with bureaucracies, if they were a governmental agency or what have you. Um, some of the few problems I ran into with employers, and interestingly enough... Um, Did ethical issues ever? Yeah. yeah. The rule of thumb, and this is true in the clinics and in the externships, was if you get through the semester without having to deal with a couple ethical issues, one of two things is happening. One is you're incredibly lucky mm -hmm. that nothing's come up, or more likely, you're not paying attention because ethical issues arose all the time. And uh, it was really important for students to see how ethical issues were or were not handled uh, in the actual practice and how often they, they could be just swept under the rug uh, and ignored or they were dealt with by coming up with the most convoluted way of rationalizing, rationalizing how this wasn't an ethical problem. Um, but we had, I think, four or five points in, during the semester where ethical issues were addressed. I think two of the, at least one of the journal entries was devoted to ethical issues. And at least two of the weekly sessions um, on the discussion boards were to, focused on ethical issues. Their first meeting with their, their site supervisor was to deal with ethics. And uh, I also told them before they went to their placement, they should contact their supervisor and say, um, I know you didn't ask me to do anything, but I want to know what ethical rules are going to apply there. Uh, any special concerns you have about ethical issues that you want me to think about in advance of my showing up, you know, come September. Um, so I tried to emphasize the ethical issue. In fact, at one point, um, at the point where we students had to have one credit hour in ethics or something, uh, there was an ABA or a New York, I can't remember which requirement it was. Uh, we had enough contact on ethical issues in this course that uh, we could very easily state ethics is a big focus on this course. It meets that, that one credit requirement. When it went to two, we said no, no, we, they, they need to go to a more of a doctrinal yeah. class. It didn't change how much we pushed ethics yeah. in yeah. the externship, yeah. though. Uh, same thing was true in, in uh, the clinics as well. Uh, am I right? You were also involved with our students uh, in connection with a New York uh, pro bono scholars program. Yes, which is effectively another externship, uh, but it's aimed solely at uh, representation of low income New Yorkers. Now, I take that back. It could be in another state. Uh, but they had to be low-income eligible clients. Uh, you couldn't um, clerk for a judge and, and have that count in the pro bono scholars program. Um, it had to be a legal services program. There were very few governmental agencies that it would work for because the client was not the low-income person. The, the client was the governmental agency. Um, and the, in fact, there were some private law firms, there were just a couple at that time, uh, where the student would work for the private law firm, but only doing that private law pro firm's bono pro bono work. Um, and that counted, uh, because the, the direct beneficiary was the low-income client. Um, and that actually expanded some possibilities, where a student said, look, I, I really want to go to the big firm. I want the experience. And I really would like the idea of working for low-income people. That was a, it was a great mix. Um, the law firms were a little slow in catching on to that. And I don't know what the situation is now. Mm -hmm. I don't think I had more than one or two students a so semester. So it was not a large scale. No, no. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, the Pro Bono Scholars Program only was in existence my last two years. Uh, the first year we had eight, nine students, 
which was one of the largest groups in New York. Uh, I, don't, I think one school had 12 students and everybody else had two, three, four students. Uh, I don't know what the, the numbers are now, but we had one of the largest contingencies, at least that first year. The second year was a very small number. Do you have overall reflections on the evolution of clinical and skills education at mm -hmm. Cornell Law School or more generally? Yes. Um, I think there are probably two major changes during the time I was here. The first was uh, after I'd been here a couple years, instead of having sort of a unitary legal aid, general civil legal aid clinic with five faculty members who, as I said, were, were sort of interchangeable, uh, doing the same sorts of cases, etc. cetera. Um, when Russell Osgood became dean, he, he was interested in seeing a little more variety being developed. And, and that was the same time that I became the director. And it was sort of my charge to diversify the clinic. And frankly, I would not have predicted uh, the degree of diversification that has occurred over these 30 years. Uh, and I, in some ways, I think it went too far because uh, we, we don't really have uh, a, a legal aid clinic anymore. That is one that does general civil f litigation and representation for local uh, people. We're, we're much more highly specialized. Um, but nevertheless, that was sort of the start of it. Um, and it was good from a faculty point of view because it meant that my ex the expectation for me was that I wasn't just going to do the same sort of clinic semester after semester. I might do some variations. I might do a religious liberty clinic with Gary Simpson or Bob Seibel Sy started the uh, externships that I ended up picking up later on. Um, and uh, I think the next big change was that, um, and several of us have been sort of agitating for this for a number of years, was we thought we should have more coordination, particularly when the, the various different clinics started up, uh, but more coordination between those clinics and the skills courses themselves. Uh, so skills, simulation courses, clinics, externships could all sort of have some centralized oversight. Um, and I don't know, John been doing it maybe 10, 12 years, I think. And I think that was helpful, uh, particularly when we were scattered and we had a, a legal aid clinic uh, we had the people in the lawyering courses, uh, we had externships, we had trial ad and other skills courses, but we all were sort of off in different directions. Um, and like, like I said, I think maybe we've gone too far in splintering, but uh, the bottom line is that attention is being paid to jumping that gap between the doctrinal knowledge a student needs to have when they graduate and some practical experience to enable them to actually employ that as a lawyer uh, who's practicing law. And um, the, the, I think there's been significant expansion of those practice-oriented courses uh, that didn't exist when I first came here. I think when I first came, we would have Oh, probably, we have maybe 40 students a semester. So we might have, we might have a third of the students who did a clinic, but often they were repeaters. Mm -hmm. So it was probably closer to maybe a quarter of the students, if that, would do a clinic, have a clinic experience before they left law school. As you say, many of them who really 
were engaged by it would stick with it absolutely through four semesters right yeah uh, and they found their home yeah. there yeah. they yeah. literally moved into the clinic right. we have lockers down there that's where they would study that's where they would party at night uh, that's where they would work um, they lived in the clinic um, that's not practical for the vast majority of students but I think it is practical now for a student at Cornell Law School to leave here having some practice experience, whether it be in a clinic or an externship or a simulation course like trial ad, uh, where they are going to leave here uh, capable of being competent uh, to actually practice law. Um, I remember... I so without one, knowing the numbers, you say just it, it's happening for many more students. Yeah. Now. Oh, I... Yeah. I guess, well, externships, we did, I did 50 a, a year, and clinics are probably doing, I think, when we did a consolidated um, classroom piece, I think we had 80 students, and that's in a, in a year. Um, and then you add another 50 for trial ad right. and other skills courses. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, a student, a student has a conscious has the option. To avoid it. Yeah, uh, no, a student okay. has clearly has. They're not going to be kept out right. because of the numbers. Okay. And we, we did have problems with with uh, the clinics at times where we yeah. couldn't take all the yeah. students yeah. who applied. Yeah. Um, so that could be an issue, but that's that's not true now. Uh, now there's another legal dimension of your life. I don't know whether you want to spend time with it, but uh, you're also a village justice, or oh, have yes. been. Yeah. Uh, and uh, well, it's like it's like teaching. I never yeah. thought I would teach. Yeah. Uh, in fact, when I finished my military service, I said, "Okay, that's it. You know, yeah. uh, I'm not teaching anymore. I want to practice law." Um, and and the same thing was true of the judicial position. I never had any interest in being a judge. Um, and some would say that being a village justice isn't like being a judge anyway. Uh, but in fact, uh, Tucker Dean, uh, my predecessor, uh, with whom you're quite familiar, uh, I remember the last night he was sitting on the bench and I, I had gone to watch him for several of the sessions, but I went to that last one and Evening's over, everybody's gone. And he turned to me and he said, Glenn, I want you to understand that you've got a, that you're in a position now that um, you need to respect and that, but you also need to understand that being the village justice is the lowest form of judicial life in the state of New York. Now, he meant it as a joke, which was kind of funny because he never joked. Uh, he was not a funny guy. Uh, but that was meant as a joke because he had great respect for, for that position and the ability to have a significant impact on the lives of the people who appeared uh, before me. Um, but I found that uh, doing that, albeit just one or two nights a week, sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning, um, it was just a fascinating window into the practice of law that I never understood. I always thought as a litigator, I was pretty good at figuring judges out. I knew what made them tick, or so I thought. It wasn't true at all. It wasn't until I sat on the other side of the bench that I said, oh, that's what this system's all about. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm really interested in. This is what drives me one direction or another. And that insight hadn't hit me until I sat on the other side. So there, I mean, it wasn't like just having a, a hobby. It really does did sort of inform absolutely your understanding yes. of what lawyering was right. about. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I've also come to the conclusion that it's in some ways has made me not quite as good an advocate um, as counterintuitive based on what I just said a moment ago because at the, the beginning I was still litigating regularly through the clinics etc mm -hmm. so I was still going in front of judges obviously there were certain judges I couldn't go before because of 
the position as the justice, but um, but it did enable me to sort of figure judges out more realistically. But I did find at some point that a judge stops caring about convincing people that the judge is right. I mean, you always want people to leave thinking they've been well heard and that they understand why you're ruling the way they're ruling. But ultimately, you don't care whether they like it or not. You, you just try to do the best job you can. And in a way, that makes you less effective as an advocate because as an advocate, you're always trying to convince somebody of something. That's, that's what lawyers do. We're always trying to sell something to somebody. Judges don't sell. They just pronounce. Uh, now, the idea is they're supposed to pronounce it in the right, come to the right conclusion. But, uh, the component they, of education is involved, yes, always. Yeah, yes, yeah. but they don't worry about convincing the attorneys yeah. that they made the right, that the right. judge made the right decision. Right. Right. Um, so I, I, in some ways, I, I, I don't like to fight with people. You know, as a lawyer, I was sort of used to fighting all the time. That's how I made my living. I fought with people. I tried to do it respectfully and within the rules and ethically, etc. But it's combat. It's unarmed combat. Mm -hmm. With the judge, you're you're the referee. You just break the fights up mm -hmm. and and the disputes. Yeah. And you've not just been a judge, but you've been engaged, involved in sort of studies of and efforts uh, that surround the judicial role. I mean, judicial mm -hmm. ethics as well as yes. um, studies of the village and town courts. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the town and village court business uh, was fairly recent, um, and the idea was to make them run more efficiently, and there was talk about mergers, and there were questions about whether non-lawyers uh, could be judges. Uh, and a lot of that's been fairly controversial, but it's also fairly political. Um, and I'm not sure much is coming of that. Uh, but we made our recommendations to the county, Tompkins County, and, and they're trying to act on some of those things. Um, I also was appointed to the state, uh, New York State um, Advisory Board for Judicial Ethics. And it is an organization of about 20 to 30 statewide judges. I'm the only town or village justice mm -hmm. on that. I'm sort of the token lowest Lord. form of judicial life <laughs> in the state of New York member. Um, but uh, it's, it's based on a, a pretty sound premise, and that is that Judges don't want to cause, to engage in ethical blunders. So if a judge sort of sees there's a potential problem out there and communicates with the advisory board in advance and gets an opinion from the advisory board and then the judge follows that opinion, then they're presumptively immune mm -hmm. from uh, disciplinary action. Um, so uh, a lot of, in fact, I've, even before I became a member of the committee, uh, I, two or three you, times. You, you used it. I used it. I, I was saying, you know, I've got this issue. I'm not sure if I can deal with this kind of case or not. Um, I'd like to get a view on this. And so, um, it's a, the group meets like a half dozen, seven times a year in New York City. Each time we go in, I am invariably having to draft an opinion on, a pro on an issue that was raised by some judge. We take all these draft opinions in and then we slug it out for five, six hours, uh, and then an opinion's written and sent off to the judge who made the inquiry uh, and provide them some insulation if, if, as I say, they follow the opinion. So it's a mechanism that's used? Oh, all yeah. the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Each each session we do, we probably deal with 20 to 40 of these things. Uh, so there are, there are hundreds of these every year that are um, uh, requested by judges. 
and it avoids a lot of problems. And judges get into a lot of ethical trouble. I mean, I th there's this popular conception that lawyers um, are, are slimy and they don't have any ethics. But of course, as we know, we're one of the few professions where there's a very clear set of ethical rules. But not so clear, actually. There's, mm -hmm. there's a set of ethical rules that they're not always clear. Um, and that they're regularly enforced. But the same thing's true of judges. Uh, a lot of judges get themselves into serious trouble. Uh, but a lot more of them avoid serious trouble because they use the advisory board first. Um, and that, that's been a, a fascinating process. Uh, it's also interesting to see, you, you see these opinions coming out and there's never a dissent because they're always done by consensus or, and there's a resolution, uh, but there are no dissents because um, dissents would just muddy the waters uh, for the judges who are being served by these things. Um, but, but buried in that, often there is real dispute about Oh, it. real conflict yeah. internally at these meetings. Yeah. Uh, but then a vote's taken and then that's the rule. Mm -hmm. That's the rule. Um, and they're, they're not, ethics isn't intuitive. You'd think it would be, you know, if you just had a good Sunday school education or something. I don't know. <laughs> it should be obvious, right? But it is not. So many of those rules are. So many of the rules are highly technical. Um, I remember when I first uh, went on the bench. Uh, I was about to violate a rule that I had no idea about. And I had read the rules, but somehow it hadn't sunk in. A part-time judge is not allowed to practice law in front of another part-time judge. I can practice as a part-time judge in front of a full-time judge, uh, but not a part-time judge. And I thought, well, why can't I do that? I mean, what's, what's the big deal? You know? And when this occurred and the other part-time judge, I went in and the part-time judge said, I don't think you're allowed to be here, Glenn. Uh, I said, well, why not? And then it struck me that if we were able to practice in front of each other. Then you could set up a swap. Exactly. Yeah. It would never cross my mind mm -hmm. that I would do that. Right. So it never crossed my mind that There's I should have to worry about it. That's right. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, yeah. I avoided that problem yeah. pretty quickly, yeah. but I could have stumbled right into it yeah. and then had somebody complain about it yeah. later yeah. on. Yeah. Um, but those sorts of things occur all the time. Uh, We've reached the point where I, I, I would ask you, are there things that we haven't covered about your, your time here in Ithaca and at the Cornell Law School that you'd like to reflect well, on? Well, nothing other than... Um, it was clearly the best thing that ever happened to not only me, but my family. Um, uh, it it's just has been a, an unbelievably positive experience uh, for me to have the privilege of working with students and faculty here. Um, I came from a very different background uh, as far as my work experience than most of the faculty, and for that matter, the students. Uh, but I felt that I could blend into this organization very well. Um, and academics can be known to be hard to get along with at times, and um, egos are tied often to the nature of the th areas where people study. Um, and it, it, it might have been tougher if I'd come here shortly after f finishing law school or whatever. But having been out for a dozen years uh, practicing law in a wide range of areas, having spent some time in the military, uh, my ego had sort of been locked in 
well before I came here. Uh, so I didn't feel like I was having to compete with my colleagues. Um, my role here was to mentor students. Um, I had to engage in grading, but that was sort of almost an afterthought. Um, and it, it didn't feel competitive with either the students or, or faculty. Um, the one thing I was very happy about, though, was that law school was no longer than three years because there were too many students I would see over and over again. And by the time they left, they knew everything I knew. I mean, there was nothing I could give to them that I hadn't already shared. And I wanted them out of here before they figured that out. Uh, so three years push them out, get a new group in. Uh, they were all smarter than me anyway, uh, but I had enough experience that I could always stay a little bit ahead of them. Uh, but by the end, it was too late. <laughs> yeah. yeah, That's a lovely note on which to end. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you, Peter. <laughs>